Greetings, everyone, and welcome to TNO, the last six of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover. And right now, we are beginning our campaign as the good old Far Eastern nation or warlord of Cheetah. In which, if you'd like to read about our country info and the trans by Carl of Principality, please go right ahead. And the next par few paragraphs, but we will soon begin, as you can see on screen, reading the unwilling king. And almost done with it. Ooh, look at that. That's a big old paragraph right there. And there you go. Unite the Far East and prove yourself to be the true heirs of Harbim S. Nami Bog. Tsar Mikhail rose, dressed, and prepared for the meeting with his high command. It was to take place in the Grand Royal Palace in an extravagant title. For the rather modest residence that he had been installed in, seating himself at the head of the table, Mikhail watched as the generals and functionaries entered. Many were very advanced in age, yet were energetic and passionate. The th thought <coughs> of a grand reclamation of Russia by the White Army spurned them to action. Several were younger, primarily descendants of emigres or uh, newer recruits themselves. It always stresses that them they were more logical and not as shackled to the distant past of the old empire. Atomov, or Ataman Semyonov opened the door, delivering a speech on the latest developments. His hand shook and his balance was unsteady, but his voice and eyes were crystal clear. One by one, the other generals stated their opinions and expressed their concerns. Mikhail mostly remained silent and only occasionally expressed his expected approval. As the other generals expressed their opinions and concerns, they said full of thoughts of the life and wife that he had left behind in good old Australia. Once the meeting was adjourned, though, and escorted by his personal bodyguards, Mikhail decided to walk to the streets of Cheetah. Under freshly fallen snow, the city looked picturesque, and his subjects, from children to old men, happily went about their lives in a surprisingly safe city, though he was still uncomfortable in a position he had not chosen. Mikhail thought or felt for a moment a pride, a moment of pride for this island of a stability that he had been chosen as a figurehead of. One cannot simply reject the throne, and we shall begin with the true heirs of Habim. When the Bolsheviks overthrew Alexander Kerensky's unlawful government in the October Revolution, they threw Russia, unfortunately, into chaos. The White Army, ourselves included, fought them bravely for years before being forced to retreat, kept keeping the belief of a Tsar's restoration alive. We relocated to the Manchurian city of Harbin and formed both a government in exile as well as an unlikely but necessary alliance with the Russian fascist party. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the face of Nazi onslaught, we seized our chance and with the Tsar Mikhail II moved to take our rightful place. But the fascists betrayed us, stopping our advance and splitting our territory. They claim legitimacy, but they have none. With the leadership of Grigory Semyonov and his ever loyal generals, the true patriots of Mother Russia, we will defeat them and prove that we are clearly the true as of have been. And unfortunately, I play this just a tiny bit off screen already. But we have to choose whether we do the Tsar's investments in this route, which will favor the civilian economy. Or we will favor the other route on the right side of the screen with the military's addendum. Now, I'm not seeing... Ooh, we actually improve industrial equipment, which is very good. The Reclamation Act, not bad. Oh, 2,500 manpower, not bad. The Web Weaver. From a distance, Ivan Mikhailov observed as people hurried about from place to place in the market. He heard the vendors cry out the haggling of customers, the indistinct chat of the crowd. Yes, yes, this is where he ruled. This was his domain. Though currently not entirely thanks to Semenyov and Shipunov and their ilk, more and more they overhauled his decisions and took over his portfolio. He supposed he had never gotten along too well with his general staff, but they were going too far. Someone needed to put a stop to the control over the government, and Mikhailov knew exactly who that was going to be. Him himself, of course. Himself. If he couldn't convince Semenyov to loosen his grip, then he might have to resort to more drastic measures. Some freedom would have to do the people of Cheetah good, just as they did the economy. Even if his plans for a free economy kept making things worse, if the slander spread by other economists was to be believed, no matter. He just had to try and try again, and eventually he'd show them. He'd show them all. No matter how many times, he had to start over. And we have 20 PP, so let's go and start scavenging for loot. And because we have three divisions, which are probably not great, we are going to beat up the punching bag of the Siberian Wastes. Aldan. Because Alden, led by somewhat handsome Gurzap Ochirov, they have a petty warlord's fiefdom, they have no national focus tree, no, or no focus tree period, and they have no manpower, they got one factory, two militia divisions, even though, I mean, truth be told, we're trying to make a division here too. But these guys are only 12 combat with, that's not good, so, we'll see what happens, but, oh, Western Defense Scheme Cheetah, that actually be probably pretty good to do. We got a lot of forts. Nothing before it's on, on this side. Oh, directing the budget. The officer's request. I, that's a lot of worse, but I like that. Modern military corps. Um, nothing about manpower. You get more army XP. Favor the military very heavily in this budget. You get another division, though, which, which could be very, very, very good. Ooh, the land doctrine. That's not bad. Um, you actually don't get any more manpower. 
Ooh, that, you get so much war support here, though, but directing the budget. Our young empire has limited resources, and hard choices will have to be made. We must decide which sector of our nation will receive the majority of government funding. While we could attempt to balance our efforts, such inappropriate risks and unacceptable dilution of effectiveness. Tsar Mikhail has voiced his preference for funding the so-called loyalists. They wish to focus on developing Cheetah's infrastructure and expanding its industrial base. To do this, however, much needed funding will have to be diverted from the military. A dangerous prospect in these desperate times. Ivan Mikhailov. Mikhailov. The Minister of Finance has, together with the General Staff, proposed an alternative idea. They believe that civil spending should be not a priority until the region is united, and that all funding possible should be diverted to the military until unification is achieved. Although the civilian budget will suffer in the short term, a powerful army may be necessary to secure a position. Neither support, less army experience gain, more division attrition, less recovery rate, more construction speed. The military, of course. Now, honestly, hmm, I like building, and this doesn't seem like it's going to help us that much, you know, early on. Hmm... You get more infrastructure, max factories, construction speed, but honestly, we don't have much. And I do like that industrial equipment, though. That's pretty nice. And more resources is pretty nice as well. You get 2,500 more manpower, which honestly is not very good. We just need a little bit more tungsten, free resources. Oh, how much political power do we get a day? 1.37, and with Cheetah here... Well, obviously, we're not going to do reunification of Russia in this episode. Totally fine. We have one loot. Look at that. Oh, we could prepare a raid too, perhaps, too. That'd be kind of nice. But, we don't have any special modifiers using our for our warlord development, unlike people who have this legacy of the Siberian plan, or even other nations who can just directly use political power to improve social development. So, with that, we could spend a lot of political power, hopefully, training our troops, get some more manpower that way. Oh, it's not going to be easy. I think I'm going to risk it and try civilian industry needs or support. That's probably the not easy, but... It's the fate of the military, so we'll go with the Tsar's investments first. What is an empire without a military? And what is a military without a civilian industry to act as its support, producing anything and everything from com combat rations to supplies needed for logistical support and beyond? Our empire will eventually span the entirety of Russia, and right now we need to ensure that our precedent is set for the establishment of the Tsar's investments into domestic civilian industries. Not just to support our ever-hungry military, of course, but to guarantee that our state will not repeat the mistakes of the past and ensure that every Russian from the wealthiest residents of our glittering cities to the ports of the villages are taken care of and given the opportunity to earn luxury. The modern bogatir, if you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. This happens every Every single campaign, so. So after that, uh, resources might not be bad. Industry, assassin strikes at Mr. Dude over there. Alright, good luck with that. Ooh. An offer from Cheetah from Manchukuo. I kind of like to see what it will do. Do we need, we need all these stuff, so. Max factories, I like the construction speed. Um, the imperial development concerns. Let's import mach industrial machinery. Our industrial equipment is, to put it diplomatically, terrible. Other, more couth members of our administration have said even truer things about its state. The reality is that most of the equipment that we have in our factories is inherited from the Soviets, and almost all of it is decrepit at, decrepit at best and completely unusable at worst. But you can't make new machines, well, without working machines. Oh, Borman, of course. And so we must begin to search for ways to import industrial machinery for the sole purpose of kicking, starting our own domestic and civilian sectors. Perhaps our old friends in Manchuria can help out. This is not only sure that we have an operable industrial economy going forward, but that our factories will be able to effectively churn out weaponry and supplies for our soldiers, which is, a, of course, a good thing to do. I just hope we get more manpower. That's just my greatest concern, because there's just not a lot of dudes here. And surprise that the this side doesn't have that much here, like... I didn't, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe I'm glossing over it. I don't really see manpower here. A lot of war support, but not a lot of manpower. You get equipment, which is extremely helpful, which probably will be helpful. Of course, they do get an extra division. But, eh. Actually, if we go down this way, the Far East Finest. I, I've heard that there's someone, one of these warlords, can get this part of Manchuria, I think. I'm not sure who it is. Maybe it is Cheetah. Maybe it's Amur. I'm not really sure, but we're going to import industrial machinery regardless. 44 political power, that's not bad. What happens if we get to 50? More research speed. Mm. Hmm. 75 days. 7, 10. So... So we get about 2% more stability for that much. That's not really worth it. That's really just not worth it. I'd rather uh, build more factories, maybe. Actually, let's do this stuff. Uh, equipment. Actually, are we... Hold on. Before we do anything, like, let's take a look. Oh, crap. We're losing academic academic base. Research facilities are fine. That's fine. Pirate rate is going down. Industrial equipment is going okay. Industrial expertise is going worse. As well as... Oh, my gosh. Everything is getting worse here. Um, well, let's do equipment again. So, that's way it's increasing still. And then we're going to slowly make sure every, we do at least one of each one there. So... Oh, the Kingmaker. Uh, well, I want to do one of these first, perhaps. Train our troops. An extra 1,000 manpower would be nice. Industrial investments... 
We don't have any more slots for building factories. Oh, crap. You know what? We'll do that. We'll build roads then. We can't even build anything anyway, so... We're going to go ahead and do... That's 75 political power for 50. Jesus Christ, that's so much. Um, hmm. Infrastructure wouldn't be bad. The Kingmaker. Leaning back in a chair in his study, Boris Shepanov contemplated all the change that would soon come. The accursed fascists to the east, the thrice darn Bolsheviks to the west. Two sides of the same hated coin, both seeking to bring down the legitimate government in Cheetah. There were countless internal troubles too. A pathetic Tsar, unending unrest, and a seemingly eternal lack of funds. On top of all this, he already figured that Semenyov was one foot in the grave. It was becoming a real mess of problems. However, it was his mess to solve, and he would bring down anyone who disagreed with that, even in the unlikely event that it meant facing the Tsar himself. Once the dominance of the White Army, and himself by extension, was secured, and the unrest suppressed, order would surely follow the long arm of the Imperial Law across the Far East. Only then would peace begin to come to Russia. Then, as the twin evils of fascism and Bolshevism fell to the ground like coins, Shipanov would watch, just as he had with the fascists all those years back in Habim. This time, he would make sure they'd stay dead. As long as they lay dying before him, he would finally smile. Oh, look at that. Oh, uh, I guess people don't have... Do uh, Yeah, I'm going to go and do this one, and then we'll get train our troops. That's, that is the way forward. An Imperial Development Company. In the darkest days of the anarchy that reigned in Siberia following the concrete establishment of our state centered in Cheetah, unemployment was rampant and many turned into transient workers, often without a home. While things are looking brighter now than they ever were, our civilian sector is still suffering. Thus, a number of our prominent economists have proposed a founding an Imperial Development Company, a state-run corporation that is put in charge of and sponsors public work projects, organizing them to give people employment and further development of the, or further develop our crippled civilian industry. The reorganization of our civilian sector is paramount to ensure that our state has a functioning economy during the wars of reunification that are ahead. Before we click on that, though, let's go ahead and do industrial development because I, we need more factories. Passing the torch. You asked to see me, sir, General Shepanov asked, standing face to face with his superior in the doorway. The old Ataman, who leaned on an intricately designed cane, looked as though he had one foot in the grave. The years had clearly not been kind to the man who once defied the red behemoth so many years ago. Indeed, please, come in and take a seat, Ataman Stepanov said weakly, his voice almost a whisper. Stepanov did as he said and took his position on a dusty vintage sofa by the fireplace. The old man looked l longer, or took longer, bones audibly creaking as he sat across from his protege. Boris, I'll get right to the point. I don't have nearly as much time to waste on platitudes these days, Semenyov. Ended off with a chuckle, which, which quickly transformed into a measly cough. That makes two of us, Grigory. Just tell me what you need of me. Boris, my time here is running out. It shames me deeply that I won't be able to see Russia cleanse of the Red Menace in my lifetime, but perhaps I can rest more peacefully knowing that the struggle will continue without me. Semenyov leaned forward. When the time comes, I want you to take my place. Stepanov was speechless. Or Shepanov. I keep saying the wrong word. It's not Stepanov from, um, one of the other warlords. But Shepanov was speechless. He had long followed in Semenyov's footsteps, but to take his place? Good to you. I would be honored, but are you absolutely sure that I'm the one you want? I've had decades to think it over, Boris. No one truly understands what this moment means like you and, and I do. If anyone can bring order back to our sacred motherland, it is you. Shepanov's eyes, filled with their new purpose, met the Ottomans. I won't let you down, sir, and the young general. Sitting at his desk, Dmitry Volkogonov finished the latest stack of paperwork before him, his riding fluid and quick, armaments, request, requisition forms, reassignment orders, training assignments, and all the rest were quickly dealt with by the dedicated Volkogonov. However, while some men would take a break after dealing with as much as Volkogonov had been assigned, he simply moved on to the next stack of papers without hesitation. He knew he was being assigned all his paperwork because the old generals did not like him, and made it very little effort to hide it. But that did not slow him down in the slightest. When presented with such difficulties, he would simply have to succeed beyond all expectations. If he kept overperforming, one day someone would have, take, would have to take notice. The only real problem was that or that he faced. A young officer under the command opened the door and saluted, making Volko... Volk Oganov look up. Immediately, he felt like he knew what he, he, this was about and developed a sense of dread. So, an officer got into a fight with a civilian while drunk. He's from your command, so his punishment is for you to decide. Letting out a sigh, Volk Oganov stood up and walked towards the officer. He didn't know if he was going. He was sighing relief that it hadn't been as bad as he had expected, or exasperation that this was a third incident involving tensions between the supporters and soldiers and civilians this week. He just wished that the army and generals like Semenyov and Shepanov in particular would come to its senses and realize they were meant to help people not hurt them. Very well, lead the way. The officer frowned and looked at Volk Oganov. Strangely, sir, permission to speak freely at his slight nod. He continued, Have you been sleeping well? You look terrible. It's been <laughs> a long day, my friends. 
Oh, I want to see what we can do with Manchuria. Contact the reformed bureaucrats. It's a sad truth that our industrial body is severely lacking any sort of expertise or veterancy. Any technical or industrial experts that Cheetah once harbored were either killed in the decades of strife or fled, apparently anywhere but here. But without those well-versed in industrial management and development, how will we be able to ensure an effective and efficient development of our industry? Clearly, outside help is needed. Many of the white officials, despite residing in Cheetah, saw significant connections in Habin and by extension Manchuria as a whole. It may be best for us to contact Manchuria's reformed bureaucrats, those who have been put in charge of the miraculous industrialization of their state. To see if they have any re resources or manpower to spare, sure, there may be a cost in acquiring their expertise, but surely it's worth it. And who do we have here? Nothing. I thought we had something here we could choose. The tourist. There's been quite a stir in the city of Cheetah today, as a most unexpected kind of visitor has arrived in our territories from the east. Our border guards detain a young man who was initially thought to have been a spy from Rodzewski's gang, but it turns out he was actually a young American college student harmlessly touring the embattled wastes of Russia. Tourists are quite a rare sight indeed these days, but the potential dangers of Russia do not seem to have dissuaded him. After he was cleared and released, he eventually made his way to Cheetah and began interviewing several of the locals. It didn't take long for the news of the strange visitor's arrival to reach the higher rungs of the government, and now... Tsar Mikhail II himself has expressed an interest in meeting this American. While we certainly wouldn't want to defy our divinely ordained sovereign's wishes, perhaps it would be for the best if he didn't speak to the outsider. We can schedule a meeting, or a meet, as long as it's closely supervised. Yeah, why not? Why not? And then, next we're going to grab a thousand manpower. It's probably not worth it. Actually, I think we're mobilizing. Nope, we were. Uh, let's see... Dear Father, dear Father, it's been some time since we've spoken. Yes, in the past, I haven't had much opportunity to write or drive to you. And for that, I seriously sincerely apologize. My life has grown stranger over the years, and I feel as though I have no avenue through which to vent my frustrations. You are one of my, the wisest men I've ever known, and I hope you can find it in you to give your foolish son good counsel. As you know, I spent much of my life in Australia after serving with the Air Fleet Arm. It was one of the happiest periods of my life, and regrettably, the situation has changed for the worse several years ago. I got an invitation from a group of Russian emigres and hop in to attend a banquet celebrating the legacy of the Romanov family. It seems like a quaint affair, an opportunity to celebrate my lineage. But instead, I found myself having a crown placed atop my head in the city of Cheetah, deep inside the Siberian wastes. As I write, I still remain in Russia many years after I left for Habin, the emperor of a realm I have no real interest in ruling. This place is horrible, father. I have no real power, and these old whites do not care about me or my well-being. The only thing they do care is about using my name to legitimize their barbaric wars and the atrocities that follow. If I attempt to make a decision, they look at me through, though I have three eyes. This land is cold and harsh, and I miss Australia every day. I feel deep pain in my heart when I think of the wife I left behind. You are my only one I can think of to turn to, father. I am locked inside a golden cage in a land that is foreign to me, and I do not know what to do, if, some, if nothing else. I can only ask that you forgive your son for being so stupid as to find himself in a situation such as this. Signed, Michael. Enter six, the man who would be a Tsar. <clears throat> when I arrived in Cheetah, it was very obvious that this was a different environment uh, to the one in Zaya. Although there were still soldiers on the streets, the people didn't seem nearly as afraid to go about their business in broad daylight. I thought I'd try and interview a few of these folks over my to try and get a feel for this place. But fate had something else in store for me entirely. One day, I was pulled aside by a military guard on the street. I had first assumed that I was in some sort of trouble, but instead they brought me to an opulent mansion not far from the city. As it turns out, the Tsar who supposedly rules this place wanted to see me personally. The Tsar, Mikhail II, was not at all what I imagined. Firstly, he spoke fluent English with a distinctly British sort of accent. When I asked, he told me that it was actually his first language, and he was still learning Russian. Imagine that. The man who is supposed to be the Emperor of Russia can't even speak Russian. He was quite humble as well, and seemed genuinely fascinated with my journeys, as well as the fact that I came here from America. He became rather distant after continuing to talk about what it was like in America and proposed instead to show me the, around the city of Cheetah. We had a lot of fun, but I couldn't help but notice some army types were following us at every turn. Come to think of it, the entire visit felt rather <clears throat> off. Mikhail himself always sounded very nervous and was constantly looking over his shoulder. <laughs> Security at the mansion seemed way over the top for me. Were they trying to stop people from entering or someone from leaving? Nosy Americans. I'm joined with my cat, Binky. Right, Binky? He's just sleeping on my chair. Big old, beautiful, really overweight Binky. All right, the Imperial Transport Commission. Siberia is, to put it lightly, vast and ill-connected. For many of our soldiers, weeks-long marches are required to get from one place to another, and it's often worse for the peasantry living in the towns and villages within our domain. The economic inefficiencies caused by the logistical issues presented to our administration are simply unacceptable, especially in the light of conflicts that lay just around the horizon. We must found the Imperial Transport Commission, headed by the most experienced of our white emigre friends, of course, which will be tasked with the connecting of all the towns and major villages within our statelet. Very good. 
Good, good. Manchurian Industrial 8. Oh, I love Manchuria. A reply to our request has come through today, sent directly from the capital Manchuria. The reply, dripping with formality, barely contained the implication that the letter hid. The subsequent industrial aid that would be provided to the Tsars and Cheetah would come at a cost, and the cost would be more than just money. The Manchurians and the Japanese masters frequently dealt in favors, something that a government has already accepted as reality. On a long enough timeline, it seems likely that they will come knocking at our front door and asking to be repaid. However, in the meantime, it appears that Manchuria, likely with the permission of the Japanese, have agreed to our proposal for industrial aid. This is a fantastic win for us. While it won't necessarily help us directly legitimize the government and provide a political recognition, it will, however, allow us to bolster our petty industrial output and shore up our manufacturing. One way or the best one of the best ways to ensure our victory over our rivals is to make sure that we can put more guns in our people's hands than they can. And that's just what we intend to do with this aid. When can we expect the first shipments? Oh, consumer goods. Oh, that hurts for oh god, how many years is that? One, two, three. I think that's three years. If I add correctly, sometimes that works. Well, we can't build bad words anyway, so whatever. Just uh, people might want to raise. I I'm, I'm considering building the, a lot of the uh, forts here, which honestly would probably be beneficial. I want to rush through this as fast as possible, though. Siberian resources, anyone? Siberia is so frequently portrayed as a vast, unsettled wilderness covered in marshy swamps and frozen tundras. While this assessment isn't inherently false, it tends to obscure the material value of the land that we currently occupy. Its value isn't what's on top of the earth that we stand on, but instead what's underneath. The region has a large amount of resources that we can exploit, such as silver and copper for both personal use and export. Most importantly, however, the paramount resource that any Siberian state could covet, coal. Coal is used to power out or power our hungry factories, allowing them to consistently pump out the goods that we need to survive and thrive. We need to invest in the extraction of these resources for the benefit of our state and, of course, <laughs> the economy. Ah, oh, yes. Ah, Alden. We must match the strength. And then we've got to train our troops, because this stuff is not worth it. That's not worth it. Focus on research is... Eh, that's okay. We do get... Oh, that's not bad. Actually, that's not bad at this since we don't have consumer goods anyways, so... That wouldn't help us at all. Oh, you lose stability from a weekly war support? Eh, that's not terrible. But the strong man. To clear his thoughts, An Anatoly Solchuk walked down the streets of Cheetah, his a coat wrapped warmly around him. He lost track of the number of times somebody on the street waved to him and called his name or cheered on him on enthusiastically, if about loudly. His last campaign for the mayor or office had really gotten people fired up. Then again, people all across Russia were fired up, desperate for any improvement to their lives whatsoever. He did hope to improve as many lives as he could, though certain individuals made that task much more difficult than it needed to be. A squadron of soldiers came towards him, their rifles slung over their backs. Speaking of bad word, and it comes. Slobchok, suppose you are Mayor Slobchok, the closet... Clo soldier closest to a mask. His question at least sounding genuine. Solchak supposed that even though he was popular among the people with the way things were, soldiers had much more importantly, important any figures to learn the names of. That would be me, uh, he answered pleasantly. And something the matter, the soldier did not answer, instead shoving a piece of paper towards him that he had not noticed before. Frowning, he read the paper carefully, his eyes widening more and more that he read. Tax increase? Another one, he asked, sounding incredulous. Sorry, the soldier said insincerely, sounding almost bored before turning and signaling for a squadron to leave. Sobchak kept switching between looking up at the retreating backs and down to the paper. Did they think of him? Some kind of messenger he meant to give people bad news on their behalf, and a tax increase in these conditions were simply cruel, with people struggling to survive as is. Someone had to put an end to this behavior, and soon, who's really in charge of the town? Not me. I guarantee you that. So we're going to go and do this one, and the next one we'll do is do the infrastructure, because infrastructure is always good to improve, right? The Imperial Prospector Corps. That's right, be pink. More copper, more iron, more coal, more, 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 more. The current production quotas aren't nearly enough to keep up with the rapid, no exponential industrial growth that we're witnessing. Without the resources to support the massive increase in factories that we're looking at, well, pro Perish the thought. Mikhail, at the behest of the brightest economists of Cheetah, have declared the formation of the Imperial Prospector Corps, an organization that will be dedicated to the searching out of mineral deposits within our borders and begin their exploitation. Progress comes at a cost, and certainly in this, the IPC is well aware of that. But in a place as wild as Siberia, Mother Nature can take a back seat to progress in order to ensure the prosperity that saws subjects. Yeah, so get some research efficiency gain. And it only lasts for so long, but within three years, hopefully, we will have achieved. Some sort of slight greatness. And after this, actually, uh, yeah, after this one, we gotta start doing some land doctrine, just weaponry stuff, so. Yeah, Imperial Prospecting Corps, might as well. Very nice. 85 political power. Let's go ahead and see what we can do about these boys. Trainer troops, we get a little more army XP. And actually, this is a good, perfect time to do it, so that hopefully we'll grind up some more XP right here. And we'll see what they say. Pay tribute. Or tribute pay. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. This happens every time we play as a warlord. So, thank you for the political power, and thank you for what we have. Now, currently, what do we have? Well, at least we got some green here. Poverty rate, we can't do much about that right now. Industrial expertise, I think I want to help out literacy. No, we're going to get started with uh, agriculture. 
I'm, I don't. It doesn't matter. We gotta get agriculture done because that's the second best to do. So, it is what it is, and we've made our decision. You know, strategic resources extraction that'd be really good. And let's get our industrial equipment done. Strategic resources extraction. Well, the industrial equipment that we received from Manchuria and abroad helped revive our civilian industry and allowed us to actually operate uh, the factories that we currently possess. Sadly, it's not enough for us to expand our resource extraction campaigns. Imperial development company as effective as it has been so far seems to be a bottomless pit of demanding further resource allocation to ensure continued development schedule. And one of the most pressing demands that their administration has come to us with is the implementation of a further resource extraction. Thus, we must take on a domestic effort to improve our industrial equipment as it has now become possible so that we can take full advantage of the natural resources afforded to us by the bounty of Siberia. Beautiful. And infrastructure, please. Thank you very much. We can't even build stuff here, so... Well, actually, it looks like we were building stuff. Oh, we can build stuff. But it is... Oh, Baratia. Well, that sucks for you, Baratia. That really sucks. There goes the triumvirate. Nice, my friends. Yeah, well, I'm beelining through this. An industrial empire? You bet it is. With no shortage of assistance from the Imperial Development Company, the Imperial Transport Commission, the industry of Cheetah, the heart of the white movement has gone from terminal to soaring and roaring in the past a matter of months, it seems. As our industry and output gets stronger, we continue to construct more factories in an ever-increasing cycle of industrialization. Ooh, civil rights. But we shouldn't stop here. This industrial growth is only a minor step towards our goal, a fully industrialized state spanning from the Pacific to the Baltic. Nevertheless, the models for growth that we have constructed and tested in the areas of Cheetah and their general success will act as examples for what we can do in the future, but for now, there's no rest for the brave worker. The death of Ataman. The most unfortunate news has arrived from Cheetah, the capital of Russian monarchism in the Far East. Grigory Mikhailovich Semyonov, known as the Ataman, has passed away from the natural causes at the age of 71, a popular figure in Cheetah, and a valuable ally of Tsar Mikhail. He is a part of this world who joined the many predeceased comrades. Born in the trans by Colin, 1809. Oh, 18, wow, 1809, no, 1890, my dyslexia is kicking in, kicking in, apparently. Semenyov first distinguished himself in the old Tsar's Cossack legions during the Great War. When the Civil War began, he organized some of the first anti-Bolshevik revolutions in Transbaikalian with the help of both the Czechoslovak Legion and the Japanese. Managed to seize both Cheetah and the surrounding regions. There he held out against the Soviets even as the rest of the white movement crumbled, long before being forced to flee into Manchuria. Decades later, as a leader of the emigre community in Habin, he became a leader of the Japanese-supported anti-Bolshevik front and rose to become an indisputable chief of the military clique, the crown Mikhail Andreevich, taking the new Tsar to Cheetah upon his triumphant return to the city. As for which his wishes, the Ottoman has been buried in his home village of Kranza. While it may be dangerously close to the frontier of the socialist revolutionaries, thousands of people from peasants and generals have visited to pay their respects or pay their respects for him. Even His Majesty has issued a statement expressing his condolences. Semenyov may have left behind a troubled legacy for some, but all of Cheetah recognizes him as a strong and respected leader. That's an awesome image right there too. He defended his motherland until his final moments. Yes, he did. Good. Ah, there we go. Industrial Empire and the Reclamation Act? Yes, we shall. And we get more manpower, four more building slots, favor the civilian sector very heavily. Good, good, good. Our small enclave has many things, an ever-dedicated office of coal, the, big, the best troops that can be conscripted, and factories that belch out refined industrial goods day in and day out. What we are lacking, however, is usable arable land. Sadly, apart from the city of Cheetah and a few other mentionable towns and villages, most of the land that is controlled by the emperor, the all-Russian administration, is completely unusable. Vast tracts of marshes and forests are so thick that a man could barely pass through the trees after a wise suggestion whispered into the ear of the Tsar, Tsar himself, Mikhail II, has declared the implementation of the Reclamation Act, a law that puts the Imperial Development Company in charge of the clearing unusable land to transform it into tracts of earth that can be used for anything from low-yield farming to training grounds for our troops. Anything's better than the squalid backwaters that the IDC has been tasked with clearing. Changing of the guard, though, the news of Grigory Semenyov's death had filled Tsar Mikhail II with apprehension. The man had all but kidnapped him, carrying him along as a puppet of the frozen in the city of Cheetah, and yet he had been a had known quality. Mikhail had known where he stood. He could not yet say the name of Semenyov's replacement, both as interim prime minister and as commander-in-chief of the military as a whole, Boris Shepunov. He knew of the general, of course, Semenyov's long-serving protege, and he had interacted with him before, but never in such a political capacity. Shepunov had spoken grandly at Semenyov's funeral, eulogizing the man and proclaiming his greatness, no doubt already knowing that he would be stepping forward to fill the power vacuum. Mikhail was sure that he had equally grand plans, a white army always did, especially when they involved him. Which was why, on this very day, when we formally invited to ship enough to take control over the government. He had to fight hard to keep his expression neutral. The man's entire demeanor was entirely different. He walked differently. He spoke differently. His eyes even seemed to have, if possible, gotten even colder than he had remembered. As Shipunov thanked him for his confidence and turned to leave, no doubt to execute whatever plans he already had made, Mikhail could no longer prevent a grimace from crossing his face. What was to come, and what did it mean for him? Will he be any different? Well, time will tell, my friends. 
0.97, almost roughly one a day, not bad, the reclamation, reclamation, reclamation act after that. And just in case, we'll probably do the Western Defense Scheme for Cheetah, but... Oh, Tito, I thought we already beat Tito. Or I think it was already beat, but whatever. I'd like to get this done, just just in case eventually, but the Tsar and the General. So went Boris Shepanov, hands folded neatly on the desk. So went Mikhail Andreevich, his new puppet, nervously gripping the dress of the chair. As you are aware, I'm now your interim Prime Minister as well as Commander-in-Chief of the White Army. I shall be taking on all other duties handled by my predecessor as well. Rest assured that that's rather swell, Commander Shepanov, but I've been meaning to ask you something for a while now. Yes, my Tsar? Shepanov asked, his face twitching ever so slightly. He despised being interrupted, especially by someone like the human weasel sitting in front of him. I was um, <clears throat> wondering, hypothetically, that if... What what if I didn't uh, want to stay here in Russia, I mean? What are you saying? You're the Tsar! You cannot leave! Shepanov raised an eyebrow. I don't like it here, Shepanov, please, if you would! Let me make one thing perfectly clear, Majesty. You're going to be staying here in Russia for as long as that crown rests on your head. And I would suggest strongly to put to bed any thoughts of abandoning your destiny. Mikhail wilted as his new overseer spoke and retreated into his usual defeated silence. Whatever slim hope that remained within the puppet Tsar, it was all crushed into the dust in that instant. The Tsar's tired. Please see him to his quarters, whether he likes it or not. Amur. How strong is Amur? Uh, they do have loot over there, and a bunch of fascists over there. Oh, I don't know. They have potentially one more division than us, so... Uh, let's get slightly more manpower. That's good. Oh, look at that. Oh, I don't know if I want to raid. We have no loot, so they might not want to raid us, but... Mm, I don't know, man. I like beating up Alden. I like beating up weaker people. Don't quote me on that. Um, making our play it requires all the following. So we, can we still do that? I'd love to get that land auction. Signed, Michael. Dear Father, I never got a response to my last letter. I can't help think that that means either you never received it or are too intensely disappointed in your son to craft a response. Oh, man. I wouldn't blame you. What I did was foolish and deeply unbecoming of one such as myself, and I should have known better. I should have chosen better, but what's done is done, and now I have no choice but to face a heck of my own making. I sincerely regret once again troubling you with my problems, but in truth I have nobody else to turn to. This land is foreign and cruel. I have no friends, only scores of villainous men who pretend to respect me in public and no doubt mock me in private. I am a living, walking joke, they call me Tsar, but everyone knows the truth. I'm a puppet, a figurehead. I'm not convinced that Russia is one of the worst places on earth. The nights are long, the winters are longer, and the people of this land are t irritable and violent. I've gained newfound respect for my forefathers, who somehow managed to keep this godforsaken frozen heck under control. My e. armies have seen a great many victories, but I cannot share their enthusiasm. How can I? They claim to be fighting on my behalf, but this is not true. They do not fight for me. They fight for the idea I've chosen to represent, for the men who hold me captive. I desperately want to leave, but I cannot. I am kept under house arrest in all but name a glorified pet to these relics. I beg of you, if you cannot show me pity, at least tell me what I can do to try and pull something positive out of this pit I find myself in signed your son Michael oh boy I'm sorry my lip balm just fell so oh Alden's back oh, I love Alden ah oh, let's make this a tradition my friends let's just beat up people in the east oh, okay so focus on research industrial development is next uh, we have how many factories four and four military and four civilian not bad political campaigns research uh, external investments man it's not worth it Main, main or play? I would like to do all this if I can. I'm going to do the military as a denim. Fair the military and the budget. I, I like to do both because I at least get a land auction or something. No empire is formed and no empire endures without a strong military. Without us, Ataman Semenyov, having led us on the long journey to Cheetah, understands this implicitly. But we find ourselves weakened by budget cuts imposed upon us by the civilians. This is intolerable. Dangerous. We have submitted an addendum to the budget currently under review, which, if accepted, will ensure that we get the resources we need to prepare for the fights ahead. All we need to do is meet with the Tsar and convince him of the addendum's importance. Without it, the state will not endure an offer from the moderates. An unexpected visitor has come to Cheetah requesting talks with the government. This particular visitor happens to represent uh, Mikhail Mikoski's wing of the Russian fascist party, and he claims that a conflict between Mikoski's fascists and those of Rodzeski will soon occur. In the event of this war, Mikoski's faction wishes for the ceasefire between our forces so that he may better focus on the enemy at hand. While we can hardly trust these despicable fascists, we cannot deny that Rodzeski is far and away the larger threat at the moment. Of course, this ceasefire would only last until after the war with Rodzeski has concluded. Very well, but we've got... Uh eyes on them. Nice. The Reclamation Act. Reclaiming the wilderness, my friends. And I want that land auction done quickly. And after that one, then we're going to do this one. Cool. 
proclaiming the wilderness. Exiting his lodge with a fishing rod in hand, Kareel surveyed the landscape before him. It was another beautiful, picturesque day in the unspoiled Siberian wilderness. The rest of Russia was going to heck, but as far as Kareel was concerned, this place was a paradise on earth, or at least it was, until Kareel spotted a pillar of black smoke rising from the tree line. Looking more closely, he thought he saw distant trees beginning to tumble and flocks of birds frantically flying away. What the heck? Kareel exclaimed, throwing down his rod as he ran off to investigate. When Kirill finally arrived at the scene, it was worse than he feared. Scores of workers in hard hats wore in the process of chopping down trees by the dozens, and large construction vehicles were recklessly tearing up the ground. In the midst of all this, a foreman was directing the workers. Kirill clenched his fist as he angrily approached the foreman, unconcerned with the mo notion that he may be trespassing. The foreman, a grizzled older man like Kirill, turned to face the strange man approaching him from the forest. Who are you? What the heck do you want? I'm Kirill, and I live back that way. And I want to know why you're tearing down my forest. The foreman chuckled mockingly in response. Your forest? This ain't your property, pal. We checked. Kirill was visibly unsatisfied with this answer. This is where I come to hunt. I survive off the land. Who gave you the right to come and rip it all apart? The foreman said, look, we're with the Imperial Development Company. The government said that we were to clear space for construction, so take it up with them and stop wasting my time. The foreman turned away from Kirill and took this as his cue to leave. Kirill quit promptly retreated in Hoff, and he knew he would be spending much of his night writing angry letters. No land is safe for the march of progress. And maybe that's okay. Oh, uh, we have a whole loot. Hmm. Well, industrial investments because... Hey, look, manpower. Love it. Come on, give us that booty loot. Awesome schools. Because that's one I barely remember that we have, right? Yeah, we'll get that one slightly better. Slightly. Okay, uh, yeah, we're gonna... Just hold on to political power. You don't have to rush political power right now, so... Actually, you don't ever have to rush political power. Just kind of hold on to what you have for now. Zaya, I would like to rush in here as fast as possible to at least get the territory so we can core it as fast as possible. So, that is my prerogative all right now. Now, playing as these guys probably would not be easy and more, but I will play as them eventually. Hopefully. Logistics Wizard, absolutely. And Vladimir Abernov, no, nothing there, okay. Metzdenum, a Western Defense Scheme, Cheetah. The city of Cheetah, over four decades ago, was the capital of the Trans Baikal Cossack Coast, where Ottoman Stepanov had made him his last stand, the final hope for the defeating Bolshevism in the East. Now is once again our hope for restoring the Tsar to its rightful place in the nation, and the army must take careful steps into to defend its holdings. The provisional capital of the monarchy is situated dangerously close to the frontier where control ends. We have no choice but to protect it, and thus the high command has suggested the construction of the fortifications and the design of new plans to ensure Cheetah will not fall. West and north of the city, additional garrisons will be placed and new defensive lines will be formed. As our headquarters, it is the first place where our overhaul of the defenses will, of course, begin, and we're led by despotists versus liberal dem democrats, national daddyists, as well as fascists. Cool. So after that, we definitely need to do this one. Requires all the following. Um, yeah, let's get, give you one in Western Defense. Oh, money makes the war go round. As the Principality's Minister of Finance, Mikhail, Ivan Mikhailov was used to the higher commanders of the White Army making appointments to speak to him, or just as often not making them and arriving anyway. This particular meeting was one of the latter variety. The general, one of those closest to Semenyov's inner circle, had walked right past his deputies and secretaries entering Mikhailov's office and closing the door behind him. From his demeanor, Mikhailov could tell that whatever the man wanted, it would not be something he himself would be pleased to grant, and that he would not have a choice besides. The request was, as is expected, was polite. The military would be requesting further funding to be diverted towards their own initiatives in the upcoming budget in order to ensure the defense of the state and the Tsar, of course. The authorization for that diversion to be included was placed in front of him a moment later, with all that specific amounts and diversions meticulously identified. All they needed was, was his signature at the bottom line. Under the general stare, Mikhailov knew he would and did sign the document. The general whisked away a moment later, leaving without further word. As the door closed behind the man once again, Mikhailov once again felt the deep frustration that had grown used to begin to build within him. This time, however, it was even stronger than usual. The military had always ensured its own pri primacy in the prison... Principality's budget, but lately the request had grown in both frequency and amount. Very soon, Mikhailov, Mikhailov knew, and if the trend continued, he was not sure where the civil government would find funds or find funds for projects of any size. He was also not sure if the military cared. How far can they go? I don't know. But the Western Defense Scheme, you, you, you that team. If one was to follow the road leading out of Cheetah and heading southwest just before they crossed into the commune held lands, they would come across a small settlement of Uleti. Initially nothing more than a normal village, Uleti earned the attention of the Tsarist generals as the final outpost controlled by them in the west. A small military base has been built where soldiers guard the principal road before it enters hostile territory. As part of the western defense scheme endorsed by the most of the Tsarist generals and approved by his majesty, Uleti will be reinforced as everyone understands that it is a crucial choke point for any invader. By building a new, larger outpost there, we can help ensure the safety of our warlord state and hopefully stall any possible enemy from the west before they they reach good old Cheetah, of course. We're ready to go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go in. We don't have much manpower, do we? We got a lot of army XP, though. It's not bad. 
Anything else? And how much how much supplies we have? Uh, artillery's not bad. That's actually not too bad. We could give our guys just a slight bit more punch with a touch. That's just a slight touch of artillery. We don't only have minus seven. Not bad, my friends. I love it. Uh, we'll keep doing the forts, and then we'll get to this stuff as you know when we can. Yeah, that's not too bad. On the bank of the river, all. Old Yokma, as it enters Transbaikal, rests the small town of Srednyanya, Old Lekma, which could be considered the greatest base in the northeast, has proven crucial in the maintaining a line of defense against Rodzewski's fascists in the Alden clique, and continues to be a choke point that Tsar's army uses to exert its authority in the northeast, as well as to stop occasional raids by hostile warlords or simple bandit groups. A reinforcement would be required if we look to expand into the fascist held lands to secure our flanks to the north at the same time. As it is only the, the only town we hold in the region, it must become a stronghold against any army. Me. And like I said earlier, we're going to do that. I'd love to do more industrial stuff, but let's at least get some stuff going here in which it would probably be beneficial. We could do land doctrine, or we can improve our guns. Uh, I'm thinking probably land doctrine. Strategic theorem. Yeah, we'll probably do this one. I like this one. Strategic theorem is pretty nice to do. Hey, 80 days. That's why I went for that land doctrine stuff. It's so important. 300 troops. Let's grab it. Nice. Oh, look at that. Do we have another division? Nice. We actually have four divisions. Train, if you can. Train, you bunch of wackos. Yes, this one. More defenses. More forts. Nice. Very good. Wait, do we have it? Wait, hold on. What? Hmm. Okay. Well, whatever. Scavenge for loot is always good to do. Eastern Defense Scheme to pick. South of the city of Srednyanya Olekma, where we last focused our efforts on backing up the garrison, Tupek is yet another village saved by anarchy or oppression by the arrival of the White Army, since we prepared for the very real possibility of war with Rodzewski. Known as the Vaz of Amur, the Eastern Defense Scheme has begun, and Tupek is a large key part of that. By significantly reinforcing the settlement, we can end the constant raids in its surroundings, in its surroundings and build yet another strong defensive point near the frontier. My apologies about that, but my cat wanted to leave the room. The situation in Tupic is considered different by many in the government, although, as the village is tiny and there are no pre-existing military installations there. Despite that, it is judged as crucial in forming, or forming a line in the east, and the Tsar's most trusted generals believe building up Tupic will be an easy, easy prospect. Um, Alden again. We gotta do Alden, like, bro. Like, Alden is the way forward. Oh, they're doing a border war. Oh, that sucks. We should not have clicked on that. My bad. Um, uh, infrastructure is usually pretty good to do as well. I like infrastructure as well. And then maybe we'll end with maybe one more focus. Eastern Defense Scheme, Amazar. The final outpost we must fortify, and perhaps the most important, seeing as we are heading into the conflict with the fascist to our east, is the town of Amazar. The Trans Siberian Railway, although often damaged, rebuilt, and destroyed in the last years, has still remained a vital artery to the lands beyond the Urals, connecting city after city and allowing the transport of people and supplies across its length. Amazar has had the luck to not only be included in the dozens of towns the railway passes through, but also just barely escapes the grip of Rozevsky. As both an important railway junction in the last camp to the east, we must take great care in protecting the town. Reinforcements will be called to act as garrisons, and reconnaissance units will be formed there as well. Soon, they might prove surprisingly useful. But I hope you enjoyed our first episode playing as Cheetah. Also, we're on patch, cutting room floor, patch G. Uh, if I didn't say earlier, we're using the mods TNO, last days of Europe, of course, state chance tool on play the peace conferences. But if you enjoyed the episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow, as we will end up probably fighting a lot of other Russians. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.